Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with your first turkey. That's right, a completely technique-free turkey procedure for beginners and first-timers. And even though this procedure is pretty much technique-free and ultra-simple, it still guarantees you a magazine cover quality bird every time. So here we go. All right, I want you to take a large roasting pan or baking dish big enough to fit your turkey. And then the bottom, you're going to lay in one sliced up onion, one sliced up carrot, and one chopped up rib of celery. Just put it in the bottom. That's it. You're going to take your turkey and unwrap it. Rinse it off. You see the paper towels. I want you to pat it nice and dry inside and out. Now we're not going to mess around with any of the innards. This is just about roasting a turkey. So I cut off the tail. Sometimes that's cut off for you. It's just mostly fat. And then take out the bag of gizzards and the neck. And of course, don't throw that away. You can check out our video about making gravy. But this video is not about that. This is just about the bird. All right, step one here. I'm going to take my seasoning mix. That'll be on the blog post. Basically just salt and pepper. And we're going to generously season the inside cavity. Okay, I guess that's redundant. There's no outside cavities. All right, so you're going to season the inside. And then I'm really going to have to have you do this for sure. There is nothing more grotesque and disturbing in the culinary world than those burnt, turkey wing tips sticking up in the air. God, I hate those. So please fold your wings underneath like this. It will look better, it will sit flatter, and I personally will feel a lot better. All right, so our turkey's pretty much ready for the final steps. I'm gonna have you melt a couple tablespoons of butter in a small saute pan. All right, use medium heat. And when the edges just start to turn golden, you see just a little color around the outside. Then you're gonna toss in a handful of sage and rosemary leaves. All right, once the herbs get tossed in, I want you to cook it in that hot butter for 60 seconds. No more, no less. So we're basically just making a quick and easy herb butter. All right, turn off the heat. And then with tongs, I want you just to fish out the herbs themselves. All right, they're whole, so they're easy to grab. And you're just gonna stick that inside the cavity. And while the turkey roasts, that will kind of scent things from the inside out. All right. We're gonna tie the legs together, just take some butcher string, or you can always use dental floss. True story. All right, but just tie the legs together, just like that. Nothing fancy. All right, I'm on to my next step, which is my favorite, because I get to paint a turkey with butter. All right, come on, what part of that doesn't sound fun? So you're gonna take that herb butter that we sizzled that sage and rosemary in, and we're gonna paint the entire surface of the turkey, and that's really the secret to getting that amazing magazine cover look. All right, after that's covered, we're gonna take our seasoning mix, our salt pepper mix, and we're gonna season the outside very generously. All right, so pretty much any exposed surface should have some salt and pepper on it. All right, don't be afraid to turn it to get the sides and those little crevices. And once it's seasoned, your work is done. Pop it in a 325 degree oven and don't do anything to it. No basting, no foil, no pricking, no nothing. Just let it cook. A rule of thumb, about 15 minutes per pound approximately, but you can't go by that. Use a thermometer. I think mine is done when the middle of the thigh registers about 170 to 175 degrees, and that's it. Some books and websites are going to say 175 to 180. All right, up to you. I like it a little lower than that. So mine was about 13 and a half pounds, all right, and took about three and a half hours or so approximately. Now, all those beautiful juices underneath the turkey, you're, of course, going to pour that into your gravy or make a gravy out of that. You can check out that video if you're not sure. Now, you want to let that rest 15, 20 minutes at least. So that's perfect. You can bring all the rest of the stuff to the table, reheat your side dishes and so forth. And then listen to this. Oh, yeah. All right, that beautiful brown skin, the meat still moist and tender. Now, I'm not saying it's bad to brine and smoke and fry and do all those other tricks. No problem. You can do that if you want. I'm not against all those fancy techniques. You just don't have to do them. And if you're just starting out, forget it. Just do this simple method. And then next year, maybe you try something a little more adventurous. I mean, come on, look at that. That is a magazine cover. You did that. I cannot believe you did that. Actually, I can totally believe you did that because it's easy. Anyway, I hope that helps. I hope you have a great holiday. Go to foodwishes.com for all the final details and more information as usual. 
And as always, enjoy! How to do a boneless whole turkey! That's right, this is the Thanksgiving video everybody's been waiting for. And by everyone, I mean two or three people. But that's okay, I have promised to show this before, so I decided this would be the year. And sure, it's going to look complicated and time-consuming, but that's only because it is. But all those efforts beforehand will produce a gorgeous stuffed roast turkey that you could just bring to the table and slice into with no bones getting in the way. So let's get started, and for this, of course, we're going to need one large whole turkey. And size really doesn't matter here, this is going to work with any turkey you pick. And we're going to start by cutting off the flat part of the wing, right in the center of that joint. You can actually take the whole wing off the body, which makes this a little easier. But I'm going to show you this way, so we can save a little bit of that skin around the joint. Because in this technique, skin is your friend. Oh, and by the way, some kind of thin, flexible, bony knife would be the best choice for this procedure. So once the wings are off, we're going to flip this over, because we're going to start this technique from the back. And it doesn't matter what side you're going to start on. We're going to do both sides. So you're just going to take your knife and cut along the backbone and slowly start peeling that skin and flesh away from the carcass. And it's going to be a little bit of slow going when you start because there's hardly any meat on the back. So besides the skin, there's not a lot for the knife to go into. But that's okay. Just keep the tip of your knife against the carcass and just keep cutting and kind of peeling it away. And as I've said in any video where we've ever removed bones, the key is keep your blade pressed against the bone or the carcass, not cutting into the meat or skin. And all we need to do here is trim enough away so we can see what's going on. And by that I mean we're going to identify two joints, the shoulder joint in the front and the hip joint in the back, both of which we're going to have to cut through in order to get all this meat off the carcass in one piece. And I prefer to go for the hip joint first, so we're going to concentrate on the back here for a minute. And eventually as you trim around that area, you're going to identify where the thigh bone goes into the carcass, right at that hip joint. And what we can do is we can just cut through with the bony knife, right through that soft cartilage. Or, which I kind of prefer, once you can get a grip, you could just rip that thing right out of the socket. And once that's been done, it's going to be pretty easy to trim the rest of the back, but don't go down too far. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But just trim down basically till you get to the bottom of the carcass, but don't go through the skin. We'll just stop right there, and we'll move to the front of the bird to go through the second joint we need to go through, which is the shoulder joint. And what you're looking for is this kind of flat bone, which I believe is a shoulder blade, although I'm not sure. But what you want to do is trim down along that bone like this, and that's going to lead you right down to the shoulder joint. And then similar to the hip, you could rip that out with your hand, or just cut through the cartilage like I did, and that will come loose. And once you've successfully gone through the hip joint and the shoulder joint, the only other place this is attached to the carcass would be the breastbone, which is right at the bottom here. So we need to be very, very careful, because if we cut through here, we're going to cut our bird in half, and all that work will be for nothing. Okay, the mistake people make is they try to continue trimming around and start trimming the other side of the bird. Not a good idea. What we want to do is just trim down until we get close, and then stop right there. Because the much better strategy is to do the exact same trimming we just did on the other side, cutting around that backbone, liberating that hip joint and shoulder joint. And once you do that to the second side also, you're going to see it's going to be very easy to recognize where the meat is still attached, which is just along that ridge of the breastbone. So all we're going to do is kind of hold the carcass in one hand, and you just continue carefully trimming until you get to that last little piece of cartilage, and then you cut through, and that's it. And the big tip for this spot is make sure you're going through the cartilage, not the skin because you can always trim that stuff off, which I'm doing right here. And that's it, the carcass is removed, but we're not done. Now we have to remove the leg bones and the wing bones. So make sure your legs laying like this with the skin down, the meat up. And the first thing we'll do is we'll find that thigh bone, which is right there. And the key really is try to trim around until you can get your fingers and or knife blade under the bone. See, once you can get under like that, it's very easy to trim away. And once we've trimmed enough away where we can see what's going on, and we can find the joint where those two bones come together, we will start on the other bone, which is the leg bone. And if you ever get confused, just feel where it is with your finger or the knife. And then we'll simply keep trimming down towards the foot. And once you get near the bottom, just get a firm grip on that bone. By the way, a towel would help. And just cut straight down through. Don't worry about losing any skin at the bottom. That section is very tough and sinewy. So just pull and slice. And as you cut through, you're going to notice something very interesting. All these tendons pop out. Oh yeah, tendons. And those are extremely tough, so you're going to want to pull those out with some needle nose pliers. Although I forgot, you're supposed to squeeze with your fingers like this as you pull so you don't lose too much meat. But anyway, go ahead and yank out those tendons. And when you're done, you're going to have a perfectly boneless and tendon-free leg and thigh section. So we're obviously going to do that to the other leg as well as those two wing bones. And I'm not going to show that because it's the exact same process, except it's just one bone. So I'm going to remove that last wing bone. And finally... Our turkey is officially boneless. Check it out. It's kind of floppy, but very cool. 
and that is ready to stuff. Well, actually, that's not true. We got to do a few things before we can stuff it. So let's lay that down, skin side down. And what we want to try to achieve here is kind of an even layer of meat or as much as possible. So the thighs are going to be pretty uniform. And then as far as the breast meat goes, what we want to do is take these two pieces of meat. On a chicken, those would be the fingers or the tenderloins. And we want to fold those back towards the thighs. And there's like a very thin membrane that kind of holds those into place. So just kind of peel that back. See, the least amount of meat is between the breast and the thighs. So this is going to help fill that space. And then the last thing here, I like to take the knife and right at the front of those breasts where it's the highest, I like to make one little 45 degree angle cut and just fold that flap of meat towards the front. And that'll make that section a little more uniform. And that's it. Except I did just do two random cuts, which I'm not sure why. But anyway, that's it. But before we stuff it, we're going to season this very generously with some kosher salt and some freshly ground black pepper. And at that point, you're ready to press down whatever your favorite stuffing is. Which reminds me, this is not a recipe, it's a technique. But I will let you know what I used on the blog. It was a very simple butter, herb, and dry fruit stuffing. It was adapted from a stuffed pork chop recipe. So it actually uses crumbs and not cubes of bread. But anyway, that doesn't matter. Any stuffing's going to work here. And we'll put that on and press that down as evenly as we can. And then we're going to go ahead and gather this together. And it's going to look really awkward, but don't worry, it's fine. Just kind of press everything together. Kind of flop it over so the seam side is down. Of course, some of your stuffing is going to spill out, totally normal. Just grab it and shove it back in, or do what I did here, and inexplicably just kind of push it underneath. I guess I didn't think anyone would see that. See, this is why I can't have a TV show. But anyway, if anything spills out, just shove it back in. And then we're going to start tying, which is really what keeps us all together. So I like to start down at that end where the legs were. All right, that's where it's going to be the most open. And it's also going to have that little gap where the two thighs came together. So I like to put a few ties there first. And we're just using our classic. Twist it through four or five times, cinch it up, and tie a double knot trick. But anyway, I'm going to tie it up a few times on that end. And then I like to start on the other end. And then basically work my way towards the middle. And once we have that tied up like that, that's probably good enough. But just to be safe, sometimes I like to do one lengthwise tie. I mean, that's up to you. You are the Matahari of your Shibari. So let me roll this over. You can see the bottom where that seam was has been nicely sealed. And we'll put one more extra long piece lengthwise, loop it through a few of those existing ties, and flip it back over, and cinch it up and knot it right in the middle, which is just going to give this a little extra support. And at that point, we're going to transfer that into a lightly greased and fairly large roasting pan. And I'm just going to finish mine very simply with a little bit of salt, which, by the way, I forgot to do on the cutting board, which is much more efficient. But anyway, once your boneless turkey is seasoned, we're going to go ahead and place that in the center of a preheated 450 degree oven for 15 minutes. So we're going to start it hot, get a little bit of color going, and then what we'll do after 15 minutes is reduce this down to 325 and continue cooking for, I don't know, hour and a half, two hours. It depends on how big your turkey was. But what you're shooting for is 150 internal temperature. You're going to pull it at 150, and by the time it rests for 20 minutes, it'll be about 160, which is going to be perfect. And if everything's gone as planned, you should be staring at one gorgeous looking turkey without bones. And like I said, we have to let this rest at least 20 minutes. So I'm going to transfer that to my cutting board. And while you're waiting, of course, you're going to make those pan drippings into some kind of sauce. I went super simple. I just put a splash of cream in and reduced that over medium high heat for about five minutes until it reduced a little bit and thickened up. If you have time, you probably want to strain it. And again, quick reminder, techniques video, not a pan sauce video. We've done like at least 50 of those. So if you're not sure how that works, I'll give you a link on the blog. But anyway, while you're waiting for your turkey to rest, a pan sauce is not a bad idea. And then after our turkey is properly rested, it's ready to cut into. And that looks pretty impressive. If you follow my completely safe internal temperature recommendations, you should be looking at beautiful, juicy, tender meat. And that slice was right through the breast section. Let me make one more cut through the dark meat. And you can see, equally as impressive, just a gorgeous, gorgeous method for turkey. So let me go ahead and plate up a slice. And no, I don't have all the fixins. Thanksgiving's next week. So I'm just going to serve this as is, with a little bit of that gorgeous pan sauce. And that, even without the mashed potatoes and yams, is a very impressive looking plate. And like I said, that meat should be moist and delicious, beautifully scented by your stuffing. And I assume you have a favorite stuffing recipe, which is going to work perfectly here. If you don't, I'll tell you what I used here. Like I said, it was just a very simple herb and dried fruit stuffing. So anyway, that's it. A very, very long, but hopefully slightly interesting video. It's been my experience that the only thing new cooks fear more than actually cooking the turkey is carving it at the table. I mean, come on, there's a lot of pressure. Your in-laws staring at you like, what is this guy doing? Oh my God. So while this does take a little time and effort beforehand, it eliminates all that at the table stress, okay? So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, 
Enjoy. Peruvian turkey. That's right. This is how our friends in Peru do their Thanksgiving turkeys. Only instead of turkeys, they use chickens. And instead of calling it Thanksgiving, they call it Thursday. But none of that changes the fact that this was one of the juiciest and most flavorful turkeys I've ever made. And if you're looking for something a little less traditional this holiday, well, it doesn't really get less traditional than this. So here we go. We're going to start by prepping our turkey. And all that means was unwrapping it, taking out that little bag of stuff inside, patting it dry. Yes, I like my turkeys like I like my martinis. And then to prep this for the marinade, we're going to take a spatula and simply slide that between the skin and the flesh on either side of the breastbone. And as long as you're using something that's kind of flexible and doesn't have any sharp edges, this is going to be pretty easy. That skin's pretty tough, so it shouldn't poke through. And you're going to go down as far as you feel comfortable. And that's going to allow us to get this incredible marinade under the skin as well as all over the surface. So once that's been prepped, we're going to set that aside and we're going to start the marinade, which is actually more of a wet rub. So we're going to do this in a blender. Obviously, food processor will work. And we're going to toss in a whole bunch of peeled garlic cloves. We're also going to put in some dry oregano, some paprika, two different kinds. I'll tell you which one's on the blog post. And then a ton of cumin. Like you're going to have to buy a whole bottle of cumin for this. But it's worth it. We're also going to add some freshly ground black pepper some soy sauce. That's right, soy sauce. Peruvian cuisine has a lot of Asian influences. And then last but not least, some oil and some vinegar. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to blend that into a thick paste. Obviously, this is edited for time, but let that blend for about a minute. You want this very smooth and thick. And at that point, we're going to go ahead and pour it over our turkey and start to spread it around with our spatula. And not only do we want the surface covered, but we're going to take spoonfuls of that on our spatula, and we're gonna go ahead and shove that under the skin where we separated it. And then we're just gonna use the edge of the spatula to squeegee that wet rub underneath the skin all the way down as far as we can go. So we're gonna to try to apply a couple tablespoons underneath each side of the breast, and that's really gonna to help to flavor that breast meat from underneath. And once we've done that, we're gonna go ahead and make sure the outside's completely covered. As you can see here, I bailed on the spatula and I went full fingers because we want complete coverage. And turkeys are famous for their nooks and crannies, so make sure you've rubbed it everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And then once you and the turkey are completely covered with that mixture, let's go ahead and clean up the bowl a little bit. And then all we're going to do is let that sit out at room temperature for one hour. Oh, and don't worry, that's safe. I'm pretty sure. And you really don't need to cover it unless you have some kind of insect issues. You can always throw a little piece of plastic over, but I kind of like that it dries out a little bit. And then one hour later, we're going to transfer this to our roasting pan. If you have one of those little racks, go ahead and use it. If not, no worries. And then a couple last things before we pop this in the oven. We're going to go ahead and tie the legs together with a little piece of butcher string. Theoretically, that's going to make it cook a little more evenly and also give it a nicer shape. So tie those legs together. And then whatever amount of that wet rub mixture you have left in the bowl, I want you to put about half of that in the cavity. And then we're going to try to reserve about a quarter cup for later. So just set that aside. I'll show you what to do with that shortly. And then last but not least, we're going to go ahead and sprinkle this with kosher salt all over. And then one pro tip for getting it on the sides without having to touch the turkey, just angle your hand while you sprinkle the salt and it will bounce onto the sides. That's right, bounce with me. And by the way, for that to count, you have to call bank. And then once that's been seasoned, we're going to go ahead and place that into a preheated 325 degree oven for approximately 15 minutes per pound, which in my case was about three and a quarter hours. And I'm gonna give you a ton more info about that on the blog post. And then one thing we can do while we're waiting, we can go ahead and take that little bit of extra wet rub, add a little splash of oil, maybe a touch of water to thin it out a little bit. You be the judge of that. And what we'll do is we'll use that as a final glaze towards the end of the cooking process. So we'll just set that aside and let's go into the oven to take a peek. And what I like to do about halfway through the estimated cooking time, just shape a little piece of foil like this, roughly the same size as your breasts, the turkey's breasts, of course. And I like to put that just over the top about halfway through the cooking to keep that top from getting too dark or too dry. So I like to put that on there. And then nothing really happens until an estimated half hour before the turkey's done. And again, I'm going to explain all these times on the blog post. But about a half hour before you think your turkey's going to be done, we're going to remove the foil and we're gonna take that reserved wet rub that we thinned out a little bit, and we're gonna go ahead and brush that all over to give it a beautiful glaze. And by the way, I really don't think that's a bullet hole, but that's certainly not gonna prevent me from telling my guests that's what it is. All right, your job as chef is just not to feed your guests, it's to entertain them. Never forget that. So we're gonna brush that all over, we're gonna pop it back in for, like I say, about a half hour, or until it's done. And by done, I mean the internal temperature of the thickest part of the thigh will be about 170 to 175. And that Peruvian turkey is done and ready to rest. Look at that. That is a pretty gorgeous bird. 
And as you can see, that wet rub really forms a gorgeous crust. And not only is that crust beautiful and super flavorful, but it really locks in those juices. I just love, love, love this technique. So we're of course gonna let that rest at least 20 minutes. And then we're gonna start a slicing. And because I was so curious to see how well this worked, I made my first slice right at the end of the breast towards the cavity. This is always gonna be the driest, most overcooked part. It's the least protected, it's the leanest meat. But despite that, it was still incredibly moist and juicy. And you can't really tell too well from this shot, but watch when I cut this piece in half, you're actually gonna see juice pouring down the bird. And if this part's that juicy, imagine how the rest is gonna be. Actually, forget about imagine, make it and see. And while I would have been happy just standing here carving pieces off and eating it, I figured I better plate it up properly. So I went ahead and sliced some up. I served it with those traditional Peruvian Thanksgiving side dishes, sweet potato tots, and black beans. And whatever your favorite sauce or gravy is, it will go well on this turkey. And what did I use? An experiment, which I will now show you is a bonus video at no extra cost. While my turkey was resting, I threw some creme fraiche in a blender, along with some jalapeno pepper, some fresh cilantro, some chicken stock, and some lime juice. And we're gonna blend that smooth and we're actually gonna deglaze the roasting pan with that. So usually these ingredients are made into a cold sauce served alongside Peruvian chicken, which this recipe is based on. But I got this crazy idea to make a hot gravy out of it. And I'm so glad I did, it was wonderful. So all I did was pour off the fat, put this back on medium high heat, poured that in, brought it up to a simmer, make sure I scraped off all that amazing fond off the bottom of the pan, which as you know are all those caramelized meat juices and deliciousness. And I knew I was gonna lose that bright green color, but I didn't care. I was going for a hot gravy, not a cold condiment. So all I did was bring it up to a boil and reduced it until it was thick enough to spoon over. And of course, as with anything we make, we're gonna taste for seasoning. I added some salt and some pepper and a little shake of cayenne. And at that point, my experiment was done. So our turkey's rested, our gravy has reduced, and it's time to eat. I'm gonna go ahead and spoon that over the turkey. And then we're gonna dig in for the official taste. And yes, that's a different plate of turkey. That plate you just saw was for a saucin, and this plate here is for a eaten. It just looked better. And man, I said it at the beginning, this was one of the most delicious, most flavorful and juiciest turkey recipes I've ever tried. So like I said, if you're looking for something deliciously different this Thanksgiving holiday, I hope you consider giving this Peruvian turkey a try. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Hasselback Turkey. That's right, I overcame my fear of being wrong many years ago, which is a good thing. Because when I was asked to try the Hasselback technique on a stuffed turkey, I was absolutely sure it was not gonna work and that the turkey was gonna be dry and tough. But much to my amazement, it wasn't. So what follows is that surprisingly successful experiment and to do this, the first thing you're gonna need is to put together some kind of stuffing. And I'll be going through this part pretty quick because what you should probably do after watching this is go find one of our detailed stuffing videos where I go through the procedure much slower. But one tip I will give you here is that you wanna crumble or cut your bread very small. Okay, so these pieces right here are probably half the size if I was doing this in a pan. But other than that, we're following standard dressing slash stuffing procedure, which means some kind of herb like that rub sage and or the mysterious poultry seasoning. And of course our onions and celery that we sauteed in copious amounts of butter, as well as a generous amount of seasoning, including some salt, freshly ground black pepper, and cayenne. And yes, I'll give you these ingredients on the blog post. But like I said, we have so many great recipes for this stuff. Most of them I think more interesting than this. But like I said, I didn't think this was gonna work, so I didn't wanna spend too much time on the stuffing. Which by the way is a horrible attitude. All right, we should always try to visualize and anticipate success. But I had a moment of weakness. That'll happen once in a while. But anyway, let's continue on. And as you saw, as usual, we have to moisten this with some hot stock or broth. And because my biggest fear with this technique was the turkey drying out, I tried to make sure my mixture was nice and moist. And with all stuffings, what you wanna do is give it a mix and then let it absorb and then see if you need more. So that's what I did. I let it sit for about 15 minutes and then went back and gave it a check. And I was in fact very happy with the moistness level. Oh, and speaking of moist, I just read online that a lot of millennials hate that word, which is crazy. What am I supposed to say adequately hydrated because you're sensitive? No, sorry, I'm going with moist. Moist, moist, moist. And then what I did to finish this off after that was all absorbed was add one egg yolk for a little bit of extra richness, but also to help bind it. 
So I went ahead and stirred that in, and then gave it one last check to make sure it was nice and adequately hydrated. At which point we'll set that aside and move on to the actual point of the video, our Hasselback turkey breast. And what I have here is one skin on split breast, still on the bone. And I was thinking of trying this without the bone, but then I decided that would be needed to hold this all together. Plus I knew for a fact that would make it more flavorful, and yes, even more moist. And then what we'll do to prep this is cut down to the bone every, I don't know, three quarters of an inch or so. Which by the way is what the Hasselback technique refers to, slicing something multiple times vertically before roasting it. Most commonly done, as many of you may know, on potatoes. Which I haven't done a video for, but one day. But anyway, I went ahead and sliced that as shown, all the way down to the bone, from one end to the other. And then once I had done my initial cuts, I went back in and did a little fine tuning to make sure those cuts went down as far as they could go. At which point I decided to transfer this onto a piece of parchment, because I figured that would make it easier to get onto the pan. Plus I knew the stuffing step might get a little messy. But before I stuffed, I decided since I had access to the inside of the meat, I would go ahead and season this up with a little sprinkling of salt into each cut. And once that was accomplished, it was on to the stuffing phase. And since I'd never done this before, I just started off putting one big old spoonful in each cut. Because I knew once I'd done that, I could go back in and use up the rest of the stuffing, wherever I thought I could fit a little more in. So I'm going to go ahead and fast forward to that point. And just by sheer luck, or maybe good karma, I ended up having just about the perfect amount of stuffing. So that worked out, but it posed one potential problem. I was sort of afraid the skin parts weren't going to get enough heat as this cooked. So what I did after I lifted this onto the sheet pan was to sort of wipe that skin clean with my finger of any residual stuffing. Because the last thing you want for your Hasselback turkey breast is flabby skin. And of course, since I've never roasted one of these without doing that, I can't really say how big of a deal that would have been, but it just felt right. So that little extra move will be up to you. You are, after all, the Huck Finn of wiping the skin. But anyway, I cleaned it up and gave it a little bit of a pat down, and I sort of tucked any and all scraps underneath. And I finished up with a little extra salt and pepper over the top, at which point I deemed this ready for the oven. So I went ahead and popped that into the center of a 350 degree oven for about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes, or until we reached an internal temp of 150. And what I did at the 30 minute mark, because I'm a curious fellow, I pulled it out to see how it was going. And I was not thrilled with how this was browning, but I didn't really want to turn the temperature up. So I decided to brush on some melted butter, which we should probably do before this even goes in the oven. So make a note. But anyway, I went ahead and buttered that breast like it should have been before, and then popped it back in the oven for the remaining 40 to 45 minutes or so. And once it was up to 150 internal temp, I pulled it out. And I was actually very happy with how it looked. Not to mention smelled. This smelled really good. So I decided at this point to let it rest for about 10 minutes before carving. And while I waited, I decided to sample a little bit of dressing from underneath. And man, was that good. It was pretty well drenched with all that melted turkey fat and extremely flavorful. So I was pretty sure this was going to taste good. But as I mentioned before, my big concern because of all the cuts was that this was going to be dry. But anyway, I was about to find out. So I transferred that to a board and surrounded it with some fall foliage in the form of frisee, fancied up with a few sprigs of rosemary. And I have to tell you, I really wanted to go from this shot to this shot without showing you the slicing. But you know what? I just couldn't do it. I really didn't want to cheat you out of seeing what happened. So I started carving, and all my shuffly instincts said use a thin, flexible knife and just carefully slice off one section at a time. But I did not listen to those instincts. I took a nice, way too large, stiff knife and tried hacking off a bunch of pieces at once, and it did not go well. And going in from the other direction wasn't any easier. And I can't keep using the excuse I hadn't done this before, but I hadn't. So long story short, it looks like I basically destroyed that end of the breast. Although it really wasn't quite as bad as it looked. Okay, it was. So from there, I just cut one piece off at a time. Still with the wrong knife. But anyway, you'll have to take my word for it. By the time I sliced through the rest of the thick part of the breast, I sort of figured it out. And I was able to plate some up. So I will discuss further the carving in the blog post. And possibly post an update with the proper method. But anyway, I went ahead and served that up with some make-ahead gravy. Which, if you want gravy, is going to be the kind you need to make for this. Since you're really not going to have that much in the way of pan drippings to work with. But we have a video for that. So I went ahead and served that up with some typical fixins. 
And I have to tell you, when I cut in and took a taste of this, much to my amazement, it really wasn't dry. It was still nice and juicy, and as predicted, very flavorful. So as I said in the intro, I was totally and completely wrong. And very happy I was. Because if you're cooking for just a couple people, this could be perfect for Thanksgiving. Or any time of the year you want a Thanksgiving type meal, but don't want to deal with a whole bird. So assuming we're able to carve this without shredding it into little pieces, I'm going to deem this experiment a total success. And even though you might be thinking, I ain't no Hasselback girl or boy, I'm still going to say and mean, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with Fast Upside Down Turkey. That's right, people have posted fast right side up turkeys and slow upside down turkeys. But as far as I know, for the first time in internet video recipe history, we're posting a fast upside down turkey. And while I generally like to limit major experiments to one per video, here I'm testing out two new things. Cooking a turkey at a very high heat, as well as trying to cook it upside down, which I've heard for decades is the way to go if you want moist, juicy meat. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by prepping our turkey, which as usual means removing the neck and any innards, which we will of course use to help make our gravy. Preferably a make-ahead gravy. So if you haven't seen that video, check it out. And then what we're going to do here is salt this turkey very generously inside and out with kosher salt, which I'm going to add it down for time's sake. But we want to be very thorough and make sure the inside, as well as every inch of the outside surface, is generously coated with like three to four tablespoons of kosher salt, which no, is not too much. And in case you're wondering, this technique is sometimes referred to as dry brining because it basically has the same effect as wet brining, but I find it much easier and less messy. And that's it, once our turkey is very generously salted, we'll go ahead and transfer that into the fridge uncovered for between 12 and 24 hours. Okay, you could probably go 48, but don't go less than 12. And then what we'll do once we're ready to roast our bird is take a loaf of French bread or Italian bread and cut it lengthwise into two pieces like this. And once that's been accomplished, we can go ahead and butter these halves very generously with some hopefully soft unsalted butter. And what we're making here is basically an insulated pad for the bottom of our pan. Since as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna cook our turkey upside down. So what we'll do once those are buttered is place them into our large foil roasting pan, butter side up. And please note our foil pan has been placed on a regular sheet pan, which is going to make everything a lot more stable and easier to get in and out of the oven. And that's it. Once we have our pan prepped, we can pull out our turkey, which has been sitting in the fridge dry brining for at least a day. And then if we want, which I did, we can place some fresh turkey herbs in the cavity. And by turkey herbs, I mean sage, rosemary, and thyme. Sorry, Parsley. I know you're in the song. And then once that cavity has been herbed, we can go ahead and tie up the legs using a little bit of kitchen string. And if you don't have that, you can just use some dental floss or you can bend a paper clip. And that's it. Once bound, we will carefully pick it up and transfer that backbone side up onto our buttered bread breast pads. And once that's been placed upon, we'll want to make sure it's as well balanced as possible and sitting up nice and straight. And since the whole idea of this is that this bread's going to insulate the breast from the pan, I tried to make sure those two halves were pressed together in the center. All right, since I figured we're doing this at such high heat, I really don't want any part of the breast touching the pan. And then once we have that situated, I am definitely gonna fold back and tuck in my wingtips. Since as you might know, untucked wingtips are one of my all time big culinary pet peeves. And yes, that hanging excess skin was bugging me too, but I couldn't get it to stay pushed in. So I guess if you want, you could trim that off. I mean, you are after all the King George III of this inverted bird. But I didn't trim it, hoping it would get crispy as it roasted, which it did. And then, speaking of revolutionary times, once all that's set, this is now ready to transfer into a way too hot oven for turkey. All right, we're going to roast this at an insane 450 degrees for just about two hours, or until a thermometer stuck in the thickest part of the thigh reads 165. And if everything's gone according to plan, your upside down turkey should look like this, which appearance wise, I would describe as a combination of absolutely gorgeous and slightly inappropriate looking. And then once our turkey's out of the oven, like all roast turkeys, we want to let this rest for at least 15 or 20 minutes before we carve it. And by the way, if I had to do this all over again, I would serve it just like this. Or as long as we warn our guests first, 
since a turkey in this position can be a little disconcerting. But part of the experiment here was to go ahead and flip this over and then pop this under a hot broiler for a few minutes to hopefully brown that pale skin covering the breast meat. So I very carefully flipped it over and what I saw when I did caused a lot of concern because as you can see that breastbone had popped through the skin which I figured was caused by the weight of the turkey pressing down and or because we used such a high temperature the breast meat was horribly overcooked which is kind of what it looked like at this point. But anyway I pressed down and went ahead and brushed over some turkey fat at which point like I said I popped this under a hot broiler for about five minutes which definitely made that pale skin a little browner although whether it made it look better is debatable. So like I said, next time I might just serve it upside down. But either way, we're definitely gonna to wanna to remove our buttered bread breast pads from the bottom, which were beautifully brown and crisp on the edges and had soaked in all that amazing herb scented turkey fat. And of course, what we'll do is cube all that up and serve that as a dressing alongside our turkey, especially if you soak it with the additional turkey juices from the bottom of the pan. Or of course, if you want, you could just add that stuff to your gravy. All right, both of those things are very good ideas. But anyway, I went ahead and transferred that stuff onto a serving platter and topped it with my upside down turkey, except I did it right side up. And then to distract people, I decided to garnish with a few persimmons. And since that breastbone was still bugging me, I actually went ahead and pulled a piece of crispy skin off the back and used it as sort of an edible sternum codpiece. And if I'm being honest, that was more delicious than it was effective. But anyway, at this point, it was time to grab a knife so I could see how these grand experiments turned out. And as I sliced this first piece, I was really afraid this was gonna be horribly dry and overcooked. Whoops. But as I proceeded to this second slice, I could see that it wasn't. All right, as hopefully you can see here, it was beautifully moist and glistening. And I really was at this point surprised by how well this breast meat came out, despite using a temperature that's way, way higher than is usually recommended for turkey. And even this first slice I did, which was right next to where that bone popped out, even that was really good. Although I really should have eaten that in one bite because of this. Whoops. So the thing I was most worried about here being a problem was not a problem. And that breast meat really was lovely. So that was good news because I knew that dark meat was gonna be great. All right, the advantage of the upside down turkey is that that dark meat is inverted and higher and gets more of the direct heat. And since that's where all the joints are and it usually takes longer to cook, that should work out to our advantage. So I hacked off this leg to be sure, and then I turned off the camera and ate it, pretending, of course, that I was at a Renaissance fair. I mean, come on, who doesn't love fake jousting? And then after I devoured that, I went ahead and finished up by slicing a few more pieces of the breast, served alongside our famous roasted smashed potatoes, with everything being smothered with our make-ahead gravy. And like I said earlier, you'll definitely want to check out that recipe and, of course, the potato recipe. But anyway, that's it. What I'm calling fast upside down turkey. To summarize, despite using very, very high heat to cook this very quickly in two hours, the white meat was still surprisingly moist and juicy. And also due to the high temperature and cooking it upside down, the dark meat came out wonderfully as well. And like I said, the only thing I think I'd do differently next time would be to not bother trying to brown the breast skin and just serve it upside down in all its provocative glory. So whether you're looking for a method to cook your turkey in half the time, or you just want to see some raised eyebrows when you bring it to the table, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below to get the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.